Hello and welcome to Rexdale Alliance Church Online. My name is Ramona Loberg and I'm one of the worship directors here at the church. Whether you're new or you've joined us before, we're glad that you are tuning in today. If you're watching live on YouTube or Facebook, I invite you to interact with one another through the comment section. If you've got questions or if there's a way in which the church can help you, check out our website or you can email church at rexdalealliance.ca. Our service today will include some singing, a prayer time, as well as the study of God's word. And specifically, Pastor Dave will unpack the story of Abraham and his steadfast faith and obedience. God asks him to do something impossible, to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, the son for who he and his wife, Sarah, had waited for so long. The part of the story that I love is the exchange between the father and the son on their way up the mountain. Isaac doesn't know that he's the one to be sacrificed. And so he asks his father quite innocently, father, we have the fire and the wood, but where is the sheep for the sacrifice? And Abraham answers him, God will provide a sheep, my son. His faith is unwavering. God will provide. And as Abraham is in the act of his audacious obedience, God interrupts him with provision. Abraham sees the sacrifice, the ram, the substitute, and Isaac is spared. I want to have that kind of faith that's ready to be interrupted by God and see how he will provide a breakthrough. Let's use these next few minutes to build our faith by focusing on the nature and the character of God through song and through prayer and through the study of his word. Be encouraged as you participate. Our God is working and he is a God who provides. Be blessed.
can stop the Lord Almighty? Who 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 can stop the Lord?
gonna sing of the goodness of God. Good morning, church. Won't you join with me as we pray together? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer because we believe that you are worthy of all of our affections, all of our praise, all of our honor, and we believe that you are so glorified when we approach you like children asking their father for bread, because in it we acknowledge that everything comes from your hand. We thank you for the body of believers that you have called into fellowship with yourself and with all of us joining together in one spirit for the sake of the gospel. We recognize the mission that you have called us to, to make disciples and worshipers of you from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And yet we also recognize that in this mission, we often fall short. We have become distracted by the pandemic with worry. We have been busy with the affairs of this life that we neglect fellowship with believers, the work of your mission of the gospel and the moment-by-moment -moment praise of Christ and contentment in Him, praise and honor for every breath that passes from our lungs to our lips. We are short-sighted creatures, as the hymnist says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave this God I love. And so today, Lord, we join together corporately and proclaim and declare, here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, Seal it for thy courts above. May we be reminded morning by morning of your goodness to us, your mercies to us, and the gracious gift of Christ and the Holy Spirit within us. May this reminder spur us on to love those among us deemed unlovable, and to care for the sick and disenfranchised, and to turn away from the sin that formerly held us captive, that we may truly live in the experience of being counted among those who have been raised again with Christ. For it is not I that lives, but Christ who lives in me. And this life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You who caused us to be born again to this living hope, continue to sanctify us, that more glory may be brought to your name. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hello, everyone, and thanks for being with us for our online service today. Pastor TJ here, just a couple of announcements for you real quick. First, annual general meeting is tonight online for the membership of Rexdale Alliance Church. If you're joining us, which please do if you're a member, uh, if you could get there a little bit early, it starts at 6.30, but get there a bit early. We have to take attendance to make sure we hit quorum. Speaking of membership, I have the privilege of announcing two new members and welcoming them to our membership. So Marie Vazalou and Alex Maliglio have joined our membership. Welcome to them. I hope I said your name right, and I hope you're able to join us for our meeting tonight. But thanks for joining our church. We look forward to getting to know you better uh, in the days ahead. Also, Pastor Dave Lewis, he has been our transition pastor for the past two years. He has been very influential in my life personally and also professionally in helping uh, bring me to this point in the church. Today is his last official day. He is leading our AGM tonight, for which I'm very thankful, and he is also speaking. So just in a couple of minutes, you're going to hear him preach to our church one more time after doing so many times over the past two years. And we just want to thank him for his faithful ministry, for his leadership, for his vision, for his stabilizing influence. And I want to thank him for how he has coached and helped me personally as I have taken on this new role. So Pastor Dave, thank you very much for your many, many, many hours and weeks and months and really years now of service to this church and to the church as a whole. We're better for it and we are very thankful. And last, after Pastor Dave is done speaking, there'll be a song. And if you stick around, uh, we get to commission some of our missionaries, or our international workers, the McLeans. So the commissioning video for them going back to the field will be at the end of our service. Hope you stick around. But now I would like to turn it over to Pastor Dave as he speaks to us one more time.
Well, good morning, Rexdale Church family. I must say that it is with mixed emotions that I speak to you for my last time today. It has been a privilege and an honor for me to journey with you over these past two years. Janie and I have so benefited from your friendships, your support, your gracious words of encouragement, and your eagerness to engage in a search for wholeness under the prompting of the Holy Spirit. We have grown to love this church community, and I must say that it is tugging at our hearts not to be able to say goodbye to you in a tangible way because of the restrictions put on us all by the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. I will say that I have asked for my Rexdale email account to keep uh, active until at least the end of December so we can kind of communicate uh, back and forth. And maybe when we get past this pandemic, uh, Janie and I will be able to come back and uh, say goodbye in a more uh, tangible way. I do believe that as a church community, you are on the cusp of a new day a blessed day of God's outpouring of his grace and peace and spirit as you pursue the mission of connecting Rexdale to Jesus and his mission. Don't sell yourself short by relying on your own resources. Let the one who is able to do more than you could ask or even imagine in your wildest aspirations guard your hearts and your minds and become your source of hope and joy and sustenance. So it is with a great amount of joy and uh, also some sadness that Janie and I wish you all the best. And we'll stay in touch. We'll be eager to hear what God continues to do. Now let's pray and uh, we'll jump into my talk for you today. Father, we are grateful. We are grateful for your presence. We are grateful for your promises to be with us always. We are grateful for who you are. You have shown yourself again and again and again to be faithful. And we just relish that and stand in that with awe. For you are worthy. You are worthy of our worship. You are worthy of the dedication of our lives. You are worthy of surrendering ourselves into your care because you are good. And so as we look together this morning at this story that we're going to be uh, considering, we pray that you will open the eyes of our hearts because it's with the heart that we really engage with you. And so we pray that you will enable us to perhaps find this morning some new way of engaging with you that will sustain us and move us forward as your people. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, this fall marks 50 years that I have been in vocational ministry. Generally, as I look back, I, it has been a fulfilling experience. However, I will say to you that about halfway through my ministry journey, I had back-to-back ministry pursuits that didn't end well. The interesting thing about these two experiences is that I entered them with such a strong sense of calling that I believe that if those who were hiring me had said, no, we don't think you're the guy, I would have really questioned their ability to discern God's will. However, what really happening, happened following the, the premature, at least in my mind, ending to these ministry positions was that I began to doubt my ability to hear God's voice and discern his will for me. As a result, I went into an extended period of assessing my, my uh, ability to, to determine my own course of action under God's direction, my calling and capacity for spiritual discernment. I must admit to you that I had to push through my reluctance to pray. I unpacked my emotions through pages and pages of journal entries. I enrolled in an extension seminary course on leadership. I made appointments with a counselor. I confided with a few close friends, and I shared my raw feelings with my wife 
who bore the brunt of my hurt by listening and weeping and praying with me as I tried to find my way forward in coping with my confusion. It is doubtful that any of us deliberately put ourselves in spaces where we will experience disappointment, despair, and dis- disillusionment. And yet so many of the narratives of our lives include these debilitating realities. How do we find the capacity to persevere in the midst of these life challenges? In this, my last talk to you as a church community, I want to explore how a resilient faith can become a gift we can offer when life experiences take the form of being beyond our control. It was for this encouragement that the writer of Hebrews urges us to take our lead from that great cloud of witnesses that express the resilient faith in the midst of trying circumstances so that we may learn to persevere in times of struggle. Picking up on the writer's reference to the cloud of witnesses, I would make the observation that we are not strangers to the use of cloud terminology. Cloud computing has taken on a world of its own. Data storage and commuting, computing power where there is no direct active management by the user is common practice for processing information in today's digital world. I recently purchased a laptop that has only two input ports, input ports, one for the power cord and the other, interestingly enough, in these days of Bluetooth, for a headphone jack. No USB slot where I can plug in my backup device. No SD card reader for importing pictures from my digital camera. No HDMI port for displaying presentations. Of course, the real reason for these limited input slots is so that I will send all of my storage needs to the cloud, meaning that once I have used up the minimal free space, I will need to buy up more room in the cloud. Last spring, I spent several weeks exploring with you some of the witnesses linked to the great cloud of faith practitioners uh, listed in in the book of Hebrews in a series of talks entitled Vintage Faith. There was one talk that I I never got to to give because I needed to relinquish that time slot to a guy by the name of T.J. Sarachuk, who was candidating for the lead pastor position here at Rexdale, something, of course, which I was delighted to do. So when T.J. asked if he could return the favor by giving me the opportunity to speak one last time, I immediately thought of the message that I had not been able to deliver and agreed to speak. In the great cloud referenced in Hebrews 11, there is one person who gets more cloud space than anyone else, Abraham. Linking back to the calling and promises of God that God gave to Abraham, the writer downloads from the cloud for our instruction these references to the resilient faith Abraham displayed. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and was too old. She believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead. A nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there is no way to count them. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son 
back from the dead. Now, it occurs to me in the light of the uncertain days that we are in as a church community due to the restrictions imposed by the coronavirus pandemic, it might be good to focus on downloading Abraham's calling by God to leave home and travel to who knows where. Certainly there is much unknown attached to being the church in this strange space and foreign environment where we now find ourselves. However, for today, I would like to focus on the second download on Abraham, the offering of his only son, Isaac, as a sacrifice. We find the record of this account in Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 19. You may want to look this passage up in your Bibles or using your Bible app. It will be my intention to reference selected sections of this scripture account as we explore together how Abraham gained the perspective of resilient faith in the midst of the most unnerving time in his life. A time when he had to wonder what God was up to and if he was clearly hearing God's voice. Together we will learn that the character of faith that refuses to cave when tested is not doubt-free certainty. Rather, it is tenacious obedience. And so the scripture account records, Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. What jumps out first to me in this dialogue is Abraham's ready response to God. There is almost a a sense of anticipation, of familiarity, of delight. Abraham is in, in, in essence saying, yes, here I am. What is it that you want to say to me today, Lord? We often have in mind that saying yes to God is a safe response. We have grown accustomed to shaping God's will for us according to our own preferences. We conclude that by giving our yes to God, He somehow owes us. We aren't prepared for a yes that leads to sorrow and suffering. God's ask of Abraham would surely have sucked the breath out of him. Had he heard correctly? Was God really intent on requiring Abraham to actually sacrifice the son that would bring to fulfillment the promises God had made about making a great nation from his descendants? The sacrifice of children would not be unknown to Abraham. It was a regular practice of the pagan nations where he had settled. However, it was not a practice associated with the covenantal relationship that God had established with Abraham. And so, although not a strikingly unheard of practice, it would have created in Abraham a deep contradiction with, which, with what he had come to believe about God's ways. The key to understanding of this ask from God is the prologue to the request. The scripture account indicates that the ask came as a result of God's decision to test the resilient faith of Abraham. Why does God test his people? Well, the Apostle James tells us that the testing of our faith produces perseverance. So let testing be embraced, James says. Allow it to be an opportunity for great joy. For we know that when our faith is tested, our endurance has a chance to grow. Testing is reserved only for those who are in a personal faith relationship with God. God is not in the habit of testing those who express no faith in him or need for his intervention. Even though it may seem unnerving and a contrarian way for God to engage with those who have identified themselves by a faith relationship with him, in actuality, it is a demonstration of God's loving commitment to our wholeness in him that prompts his testing. Ironically, when God first announced to Abraham and Sarah that Sarah would become pregnant and give birth to a son, they laughed. They laughed in disbelief over the sheer impossibility of giving birth long after their reproductive organs of their bodies had shut down. 
Then they laughed over the shock the word of Isaac's birth would cause within the neighborhood. They laughed when they chose the name Isaac, which actually means laughter. They laughed over the insanity of Sarah nursing a baby born to a centenarian. And as one author has suggested, they laughed that when Sarah went shopping at Superstore, she was the only shopper to buy both Pampers and Depends. However, Abraham isn't laughing anymore. The road to Moriah would lead to the death of a dream. The delight in hearing the baby's first cry, the days of holding Isaac in his arms while he peacefully slept, the joy of watching him take his first steps, the times of taking him to the playground, playing catch, baiting his fishing line, were all about to become painful distant memories. Moriah was the road to dashed hopes. For three long days, Abraham was tormented by the prospect of life-changing loss. The road to Moriah speaks to those times in our lives when the inevitability of loss makes our way unclear. When the path forward is dark, so dark that we hesitate to keep stepping out for fear that what lies in the darkness will crush our spirits. We long for clarity. As we read the account of Abraham's journey to Moriah, we have the advantage of, of knowing the end to Abraham's plight. We know that everything will turn out all right that God will come through, that Isaac will be spared, that God's promises to Abraham will remain intact. We want to believe that God will come through in a similar way for us. That he will make our way forward clear, dispel the fear, lift the cloud of uncertainty. We want clarity, failing to realize that by craving clarity, we attempt to eliminate the risk of trusting God exclusively. Often we presume that if we entrust our, ourselves to God, this will free us from the anxiety, from the confusion, from the pain of uncertainty, the crush of disillusionment, and illuminate the darkness. But Abraham's journey to Moriah testifies that this is not the case. This resilient father of the faithful understood one irrefutable requirement to all who will learn to take God at his word. He gave tenacious obedience. And so the scripture account states, the next morning Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. Resilient faith prompts us to pack up all of our longings, to embrace the way of sacrifice, to surrender our wills with the boundless confidence in boundless confidence to the trustworthiness of a loving God who preserves his integrity and guards our dignity through his righteous behavior. For Abraham and all who find themselves in the bitter anguish of trying to figure out how faith and the trustworthiness of God can carry them through to a peaceful reconciliation of their unsettled state of mind means to face the reality that, as Brennan Manning concludes, the story of salvation history indicates that without exception, trust must be purified in the crucible of trial. With this in mind, we return to the narrative of the trek to Moriah, where Abraham hears a voice for the second time. However, this is not the voice of God. It is the voice of his son, Isaac. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders, while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. As he did upon hearing the voice of God, Abraham responds to his son with the same intention. I am here, 
my son. What's on your mind? The boy is looking for answers to his questions. He sees the fire and the knife being carried by his father. He feels the weight of the wood on his back, but the most critical component to a burnt offering is missing, the sacrificial lamb. And so he asks, where is it? God will provide a sheep, Abraham replies. And we are left to wonder how convincing Abraham's response was to himself and to Isaac. The two continue on in silence, both left to their thoughts, questions undoubtedly still swirling in their minds. One thing I have learned about faith, it doesn't answer all of my questions about the Christian life and practice. When faith becomes more about gaining answers to to our questions than fostering a trust relationship with God, we have abandoned the essence of our belief system. The impetus that kept Abraham and Isaac moving forward in the midst of their questions was relationship. There was relational strength that had been built between Abraham and God and between Abraham and his son that allowed them to leave their questioning and move forward. Faith, from a biblical perspective, is found in relationship. When we say that we believe God, there must be more than an intellectual response based on the evidence of God's existence and character and activities. The fact of the matter is that we have not truly expressed the belief that God exists until we can say, I trust him unreservedly. Without this assertion, we can only conclude that God exists based on the laboring of our minds to make sense out of our belief. The truthful heart gains the assurance that surrender of the will and life to God without any reservation and with boundless confidence comes from knowing we matter to Him and that we are unconditionally loved by Him. Interestingly, The original meaning to the word translated as truth in the biblical record is the unforgotten. To become part of a story that is truly unforgettable, a story so compelling that it shapes every aspect of our lives, is in the end what it means to believe in God. Resilient faith compels us to step out of the questioning and into the mystery of God's unfailing love. The Apostle John picks up on the mystery of God's love for us with this acknowledgement. This is how God showed his love for us. God sent his only son into the world so we might live through him. This is the kind of love we are talking about. Not that we once upon a time loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to clear away our sins and the damage they've done to our relationship with God. Love like this is a mystery of such mind-bending magnitude that the intellect buckles under the sheer delight of being braced, embraced by the eternal hope that we matter to God and our loved unconditionally by him. And so now, in the story of Abraham we are considering, we come to the moment of truth. Abraham takes Isaac, his son, the promise of a nation, the dream of an inheritance of global proportions, ties his legs, binds his arms, lifts the boy up, holds him one last time, then gently lowers him on the wood arranged on top of the altar. He reaches toward heaven with the knife in his hand to destroy in a single move the life he had fathered and with it all, the, all of his hope and joy for a promising future. But then Abraham is called a third time. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. 
Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Abraham replies in his usual way, acknowledging his alertness to the voice. And with this compliance, one can almost hear a collective sigh among the angelic hosts. In an instant, Abraham is given back his laughter, his dream, his son, and all of heaven rejoices. A replacement sacrifice is provided in the form of a ram caught up in the thorns of a nearby uh, bush. Isaac has been saved. Abraham has displayed a resilient faith in the trustworthiness of God, and all is well. But where does that leave us? The call to persevere in the midst of uncertainty is a reality that we must all face. There is no escaping the hard challenges of life. Where the tension often comes is between the testing of God and the provision of God. The Apostle Paul helps us navigate this tension with these words of assurance. The temptations, or the, temptation, the word used for temptation could also be, be translated as, t- as tests. The temptations or tests in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation or the test to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted or tested, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Let me ask you, what road to Moriah are you on? What aspect of your faith journey is testing your resolve? You are not alone. The one who provides still provides. The one who spoke still speaks. The one who promised still keeps his promises. The compilation of our lived experiences shows God's relentless faithfulness, giving rise to a blossoming confidence that God is with us, and he will continue to be with us, finishing what he has started. Somewhere along the way in the life of the maturing Christ follower, faith combined with an expectant hope grows into what Brennan Manning calls a ruthless trust a resilient faith. The reason we can grow into this measure of faith and trust is that God, too, has walked the road to Moriah. He knows what it is like to experience the grief of loss. For one day, Jesus, God's one and only Son, walked to the place of suffering, carrying on his back the wood on which he would be put to death. When Jesus was bound, no voice cried out to loosen the ropes. When the blade went to pierce his side, no power held it back. This time there was no intervention with a substitute sacrifice. This time the son died and the father grieved. But then, three days later, new hope, new life was born. It is through the refusal of the Father and the Son to quit, to go the whole way in sacrificial love, that we find the power and the will to keep on going. It is in remembrance of Jesus' death and resurrection that the move from debilitating fear to resilient faith can be made. And so let that reality capture your heart and your mind as you listen to this concluding song by the worship team as they lead us in remembrance. Take the bread of life 
broken for all my sin your body crucified to make me whole again I will recall the cup poured out in sacrifice to trade the sinner's end for your new covenant
Hi, we're Scott and Loralee McLean, and we live in Malawi. We serve there with Emmanuel International, and we've been part of the Rexdale family uh, for about 30 years, and uh, it's our privilege to be able to share a little bit today with you. Yeah, so um, we were asked to, uh, Laura and I are going to share this, but I was, uh, we were asked to share one request um, as we go back to Malawi. Uh, we live in the village and um, we have a number of different uh, ministries that we're involved in. But um, what I'd like you to pray for us is that uh, I read in a book, um, this guy David Wells says, said that uh, the name of God, when you're not walking with him, or the ways of God, or the person of God can become, his name be can become weightless. And so the one request that I would ask for you to pray for us as we would return to Malawi, as Laura Lee would talk to my Giles, I would Bambo Giles or Bambo Mbeula or Bambo Moloya. These names obviously don't mean much to you, but we mean a lot to us. And as we teach Romans, that we would be committed to the knowing of God so that his name becomes weightful. And so Psalm 49 says, um, there's such thing called foolish confidence fueled by pomp and wealth and a whole bunch of other things. But we want to know when we show up that we're actually believing that the good news is good news, mm -hmm. that it's helpful, uh, that when Paul says the love of Christ compels me or controls me to show up, um, that God knows how to judge. He's righteous and he's just. He's, his mercy is way more accessible and way better qualitatively. So we'd ask you to pray for that, that we would um, experience as we live in our context in Malawi, and for you too, that you would know the weight of God's name and, and the worth of his name. So when we go back, uh, we'll be resuming the Romans course that we uh, had uh, been teaching and we'll also uh, begin to look towards consolidating and finalizing what our actual contribution will be in terms of mobilizing education and working in the least reached people uh, among whom we live. And so we're looking forward to being able to share more concrete details as those all get firmed up uh, in the next few months. So thank you for praying for us and for sending us out. I have the privilege of commissioning Scott and Laura Lee. They've been our, our dear friends for a, a very long time. In a recent video update, uh, Scott and Laura gave a few meaningful Bible passages and uh, these will form part of this prayer. So let's pray together. First of all, Lord, we pray for their family. As they depart from Malawi this weekend, they're leaving four kids, a dad, siblings, here in Canada. We pray for that family and for, and for Scott and Laura that the online connection will be strong and undiminished despite the distance. Lord Jesus, you have given a mission to Scott and Laura. As they carry it out, both here and overseas, they have faced opposition. But as they wrestle against these dark forces, we pray that you, they would be strong in the Lord, in the strength of your might. May they continue to be compelled by the love of Christ. May they be steadfast in love as they do their work faithfully as a labor of love for Jesus Christ. We pray that your favor, Lord, would be upon them, and we humbly ask that you would establish the work of their hands. We ask all these things in the powerful and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.